But today we're in uh, the, the uh, section of revival and missions in the 1700s, and the uh, revivals were um, taking place. And uh, we talked about the uh, last week talking about George Whitfield, uh, talking about those revival preachers, talking about John Wesley, uh, and also um, we uh, so particularly in in the United States as well as uh, Great Britain. And so we're looking at a description of the revivals um, in, in expanding that a little bit. And this is just kind of tying up uh, from last week, and then we'll be moving to a different uh, topic. But uh, as far as the, the uh, description of the revivals, in the 1730s and 40s, there was a great revival about the same time in Wales and Scotland. Key people in that revival were Griffith Jones, Howell Harris, Daniel Rowland, William McCulloch, and, and John Balfour. George Whitfield and John Wesley also preached. A school was established in Wales by Howell Harris in 1752, and many were trained for the ministries. Uh, Selena, the Countess of Huntington, supported the revival in Wales with her money and influence. Many uh, new churches were established on her property. So what we're highlighting here is what great change took place following the Reformation and how things... I mean, when you go from having over... Uh, a thousand years, about a, oh, yeah, more than a thousand years of things being closed down, things being tightly controlled, uh, and much persecution. This was, and, and the Bible speaks of in, in Revelation, the, uh, a letter, the letter to the church at Philadelphia, and that's, God says, I have set before thee an open door. And this would be a time period when there was a great open door in the 1700s and 1800s, uh, a great open door. Uh, that would be comparable to that uh, to church in Philadelphia. And, and uh, that there, I've set before thee an open door that no man can shut. So this was, the, this was a time of, of great open doors and, uh, and, and during the time of revivals. And then we're going to see in the emissions movements uh, and, and the things that just really shape how, what's in the world today uh, as, far as, as far as missions are concerned. Uh, missions is concerned, and there was also a revival in Germany in that at that time. Whatever true spiritual life existed in German Lutheranism in the 1500s was dead by the 1600s. And I'll point out again, certain groups and people we're talking about doesn't mean we're going to have complete doctrinal agreement. This is a history lesson of showing here's what happened, and some of those that then truly did preach the gospel, they may have had other. Uh, doctrines, differing doctrines from the Bible, uh, but we're, what we're tracking is the history of what took place in the revivals and the, the missions movement, uh, and, it's, and you cannot, uh, it, it, you can't cover all of it. I mean, it, it, there's just, there's so much uh, history out there uh, to cover, so we're doing really more of an overview of the big things that took place during that time. Uh, the, uh, the, so, in, so we're talking about German Lutheranism, and and so there's the, uh, a movement that rose up within the Lutheran churches called Pietism, and that was Philip uh, Jacob uh, Spiner. Uh, he lived from 1635 to 1705. He was a Lutheran pastor in Frankfurt and founded devotional meetings in his home, which were called Collegia Pietis, Pietatis, Collegia Pietatis, Spiritual Fellowships. These meetings spread across the country. He wrote a book called uh, Pia Desideria, Holy Desires, which emphasize holy, Christ-centered Christian living. Spiner sought to reform Lutheranism by emphasizing personal conviction, a vibrant relationship with Christ, and holy living. He did not want the people to leave the established Lutheran churches, however. The Pietists practiced infant baptism, but taught that each individual should have saving faith in Christ later in life. Spiner believed in a literal earthly millennial reign of Christ, promoted Bible reading, and taught the priesthood of the believer. There was an emphasis on missions, and a number of Pietist Lutherans became missionaries to America, Africa, and Asia. Count Zinzendorf, founder of the Moravians, was trained by them in his youth and obtained many of his ideas from them, including his emphasis on personal conversion and piety. Uh, he was also influenced by them in, in the sense that the principle uh, that denominational differences are not very important and also his zeal for world missions. And so it's interesting how one group influences another person who then starts another group, and that's who we'll talk about quite a bit today as the uh, Moravians. 
And uh, once again, these groups who would not necessarily agree with all the things that they practiced and believed, uh, but one of the things with the Moravians was their missionary zeal, and Count Zinzendorf, who was influenced then by the Pietists, ended up influencing many others uh, with the uh, Moravians. And there were uh, great errors uh, with, within Pietism. It allowed for infant baptism. It had a broad ecumenical spirit among Protestants. And they emphasized feeling at the expense of the intellect in their desire to combat the evils of dead orthodoxy. So, so emphasizing feeling, they saw, they saw the deadness of the churches and of the, of the, the, the run of the mill Lutheran churches. And so they said, all right, we, 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 need, we need to combat this a bit. Uh, and so then they ended up going a little far the other way of emphasizing uh, feeling at the expense of the intellect. Uh, the, so then we shift to the missionary movement. The great revivals of the 18th century were followed by a great missionary zeal. Uh, the Reformation had diminished the power of Rome, and there was greater freedom than there had been for a millennium. You think about that, th a thousand years, and then all of a sudden, this is taking place. Things open up. Uh, it's hard to even, I mean, if you're living during that thousand years, you do not know what's going to, you're not, you don't know what's going to be taking place next. If you're actually, if you happen to live, say you lived 500 years into the thousand years. Well, you're still 500 years from things opening up. That's a long time. But from our, from our vantage point, looking to the past, we say, wow, that's amazing. A thousand years goes by, or more than a thousand years. And then finally, things open up, and then look what happened. And then uh, that brings us where we are uh, today. The, uh, God stirred up churches to use this freedom, and missionaries went to the ends of the earth during this era. There were missionaries during the Dark Ages among the separated groups that we've already talked about. But things really opened up during this time period. And so those groups that we've discussed, they talked about the, uh, we've seen that they would travel and they would preach and they would do those types of work. And um, now I want to make sure that when we're talking about missionaries, we're defining a missionary correctly. A missionary is one who is sent forth to go and preach the gospel. And it is not to um, uh, colonize as far as uh, what the, uh, uh, some, some have a bad taste in their mouths about missions or missionaries, and they think of missionaries because of maybe what the Catholic Church had done regarding when they have Catholic missionaries. Well, what did they do? Well, they tried to convert the people into their system, but it wasn't just, it wasn't a personal conversion to Jesus Christ, believing in Jesus Christ. It was more of, there was more of a control factor in that of converting them to their system. And, uh, uh, and so that was, um, uh, and so some might uh, have more of a, a picture of missionaries that way. But when we're talking about missions according to biblical principles, we're talking about those who are simply going and they're trying to preach the gospel to the uh, people who need it, uh, whether they're unreached or whether maybe they'd heard the gospel before, but they're just trying to, to preach and obey the great commission of, uh, of preaching the gospel, baptizing and discipling. And, and really the heart of it should then be the goal of starting churches. Uh, there, the, there were missionaries, uh, as we've already said, there were missionaries during the Dark Ages, but this was the time of really opening up. The Protestant denominations did not carry out organized missionary endeavors for the most part until the 18th century. The Lutheran pietists were one exception. Some of the, great ref uh, some of the reformed uh, men also preached at great cost. Uh, one of the greatest missionary sending groups of the 18th century was the Moravians. And so the reason to focus on the Moravians, why they get uh, a lot of history and, and publicity as far as uh, is, is not so much what they did as far as how they practiced uh, they, they, their religion or their belief system. Uh, not all their beliefs were, were necessarily doctrinal correct, doctrinally correct, like uh, uh, Count von Zinzendorf. Um, but... The main thing about the Moravians was their great missionary zeal, of preaching the gospel, having a great missionary zeal of going throughout the world, and it left a, a legacy uh, for, uh, for churches to follow. And uh, they were founded by Count Nicholas uh, von Zinzendorf, or as uh, I guess the proper pronunciation would be Nikolaus. Right, Russ? Would that be Nikolaus? Yes. Uh, Nikolaus von Zinzendorf. 
a wealthy nobleman, uh, say he lived from 1700 to 1760. His father died when he was only six weeks old. His mother remarried and Nicolaus was raised by godly relatives and trained in Lutheran and Pietist doctrine. While in his teen years, Zinzendorf began to have a zeal and vision for world missions after he met some Pietist missionaries. And these Pietist missionaries were among the first Protestant missionaries. They had sent missionaries to the Danish colony of Tranquilbar in India in 1706 and to Greenland in the West Indies by 1722. Though Zinzendorf's guardian had already determined that uh, he would follow in his father's footsteps in government service, Zinzendorf determined at a young age you know, even if he was going to have to go into government service and he was going to make a lot of money and he was going to have a higher position, he determined at a young age he would try to find suitable men and support them to evangelize heathen tribes. Zinzendorf had a goal of drawing together zealous Christians from all denominations. Now, and this would be one of the errors of, of Zinzendorf and some of the missionary movements at that time. Uh, and so while the desire to preach the gospel and, and be united in the gospel and try to uh, get people on board for the uh, cause of missions uh, and, and be zealous for missions is a wonderful thing and many times it's well-intentioned. It's important to remember that God's Word emphasizes the importance of doctrine and true Christian unity is found in doctrine. It's a, a, a real unity of agreeing in faith and practice. And so while we might there might be other believers other churches that we don't have complete doctrinal unity on, they might be going out and they might be preaching the gospel and they might be, getting pe they might be seeing people saved, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing. That does not mean, just because they're doing that, does not mean we have to push for unity among all of these groups. They might be doing... Uh, think about what Jesus said uh, to his disciples. Uh, there were some preaching that were not part of Jesus' group, and... Uh, and he and, and disciples wanted to call down fire from heaven and they wanted to, like, we, we need to get rid of these people. Uh, they're not exactly part of our group. And Jesus uh, said, well, he that is not against us is for us. And I'm kind of paraphrasing there. I don't remember exactly what it but basically says either he, not, he that is not against me is for me or he that is not against us is for us. But they didn't necessarily, Jesus didn't yoke up with all the, the groups at that time. There were some other groups, Jesus, but Jesus had his focus on his disciples. He didn't bring, he didn't, Jesus didn't have a broad ecumenical spirit uh, even during his earthly ministry. Um, it, was, it was simply, yes, there are other people that are apparently preaching the right message about Jesus, but they weren't part of what Jesus was teaching his disciples and so they exist, but they didn't necessarily, they, Jesus uh, caught, warned his disciples or admonished his disciples about the attitude they had about them. But he also didn't turn around and completely say, hey, let's all yoke up and link up together and, and do this work together. And so there can be work that's going on that might involve the true gospel message, but that doesn't mean there's an obligation to completely partner up and bring all these denominations together uh, and organizations together. Uh, true Christian unity is not unity and diversity, but is a real unity of agreeing in faith and practice. What, what, who's, who talks about unity, unity and diversity today? Well, the world talks about unity and diversity. Well, how do you have unity and diversity? It doesn't, uh, it's, it's, it's really contradictory. Um, unity is based on what we have in common. So yes, we have a very diverse nation. You go from one place to another, you go to a, a, a different city. I mean, you go to the, you go to the Holy Oak Mall, okay? Josiah and I, on our way back uh, from our outing yesterday, we stopped at the Holy Oak Mall. And you're gonna have different ethnicities, you're gonna hear different accents, you're gonna hear different languages being spoken at the Holy Oak Mall. But what, sh so there's diversity there, but that diversity is not what unites us. What hopefully what should unite Americans are the values of America, and unfortunately not even ever, but America is not even united on what its values are, and so that would be where true unity is. Yes, we are diverse, maybe in languages, maybe in cultures, maybe in ethnicities, but there should be some core values that we can all agree on that are the heart of true unity. So I'm not saying true unity is that everybody has to to look exactly like one another and do everything exactly the same and 
You know, we have people who come from other countries and they might speak other languages. They don't have English as their first language and so they might be uh, learning uh, English or, or whatever they might be doing. Uh, and so, so there's a place that all of that is, is fine, but in the end, that's not what unites us. Oh, it all, we're all united because we're different. Wait, no, that's, that doesn't... <laughs> no, it's, well, what do we have in common? What are some things that really are... It's okay if we're different, but then there needs to be some core things that we're actually un, the same in, the unite, united in. Uh, and that's where we go back to for our country's sake. I mean, we need a country that respects and, and understands the Constitution. If we would be united on our Declaration of Independence and the principles of that and our Constitution, then when you have other people, uh, people from coming different areas, well, as long as we're united in core things of what it means to be an American, what the founding values of America are, uh, that's where unity is, uh, that's where unity happens. It's, it's, there's an agreement somewhere. There's got to be an agreement somewhere. And I guess today with the world, it's basically everybody's agreeing to be different. I guess that's where the unity comes in. We're all united and it's okay. We're, we're, we're agreeing to be different. Someone also said, um, they use the term, I've heard it kind of a couple different ways, but one person said, talking about one, one person come from this church and people come from different churches. And, uh, and they say, he says, there's a real richness in the body of Christ. You know, that here's, here's you know, one that's assembly of God, and here's, you know, this, this denomination, here's Baptist, here's, there's a real richness because of all these different, <laughs> kind of implied, well, because all these denominational, I'm thinking, I, that's not, I, I don't think that creates a, a richness. Um, I think God is interested in doctrinal unity, but they, so that was one of the things that it's important to keep in mind here with their great zeal for missions, and it was very all well and good. Uh, the uh, we, we, True Christian unity is not unity and diversity and just bringing, oh, let's bring all the denominations. And so in his case, his rallying point, his uniting point would be everybody has a heart for missions. So that would be the uniting factor. But so, if, yeah, if you believe all these, you just... If you believe, have some other beliefs, uh, that's fine you know, in, in that way of thinking. But you know, let's, let's all rally around missions. And so sometimes people have one rallying cry. And, um, and then it, you know, everything else doesn't matter. It kind of depends on what their priorities are. The, the Bible teaches that even evangelism is to be accomplished from a position of doctrinal unity. Philippians 1.27 says, Stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so there we see the importance of we strive together. We have one spirit, one mind, uh, and uh, that's not just what the gospel is. That's, it, it's, there, there are other priorities that also are important in evangelization. Uh, Zinzendorf got a law degree and became the king's counselor at the court of the king of Saxony, but his heart was in preaching and ministering. He purchased a small estate from his grandmother, chose a friend to pastor the village church there, and set out to convert the peasants and turn the village into a Christian community. Being a Lutheran territory, the villagers were nominal Christians, having been baptized as infants. So uh, apparently not a great reception um, with those who were just nominal and not really committed uh, to, to what he was trying to accomplish here. In 1722, he invited a per group of persecuted Protestants from Moravia and Bohemia to settle on his estate. Some of them were descendants of the Bohemian Brethren, who arose after the death of John Hus in the 15th century. They established the community of Hernhut, the Lord, which is, means the Lord's Watch, uh, all were required to sign a brotherly union whereby they agreed to live in friendship with Christians of other denominations and to regard themselves as members of the Lutheran Church. They attended a Lutheran congregation. They emphasized personal conversion, holy living, and a personal relationship, an ongoing personal relationship with Christ. The Moravian communities were extremely regimented. In the early days, no forms of entertainment were allowed. They worked 16 hours a day. The elders controlled the details of the people's lives. The daily activities of the members were organized according to, to the needs of the community and much of the money was held communally. 
In the early days of Hernut, the brethren established a 24-hour intercessory prayer meeting. Now, this was just basically something that was completely ongoing, uh, not just one 24 hours, but they had a schedule where there was always somebody praying. A schedule was organized, and each believer took his turn around the clock year after year. And when you're in a uh, communal place like that, that's probably easier to do. Um, but uh, it, it also shows, though, their priorities of the need for prayer and and along with mission should be uh, a priority of prayer. The elders would select a different text of scripture each morning for meditation so people would read that and meditate upon it so uh, not not saying that the way they were set up here as far as being controlled by these elders of the community and I'm not saying not endorsing all of that just saying here's what they did Uh, and and so they would read it they'd meditate upon it uh, throughout the day. Uh, Many decisions were settled by lot. The first foreign missionaries were sent by lot because there was was some opposition as far as the the, the first missionary among some of the people, uh, first missionaries, and so they they cast lots, and uh, and so they made the choice, and then they sent them out. Uh, Zinzendorf himself was a zealous evangelist. He established student groups at the University of Jena and University of Hale, uh, Hale, I think, H-A-L-L-E, uh, he established a, a, a printing press to publish tracts, booklets, and inexpensive Bibles. He invited dirty gypsy children into his home for tea and shared the gospel with them. So here's somebody who is this high-ranking, you know, you know, no mil- he's basically a nobleman, he's, uh, and then he, he brings in these children uh, of the gypsies. They, they would be dirty, they, they lived, uh, they didn't have that type of living situation uh, that he did, but he'd invite them into his home and he'd share the gospel with them. Uh, Zinzendorf also loved, uh, should say loved, Zinzendorf loved the Jewish people. Loved, should say loved Jewish people. Just left the D off. Uh, Zinzendorf loved Jewish people. He cared for their souls. This was a time, this was during a time when the Jews were hated by Catholics and most Protestants, including Lutherans. He treated them kindly and spoke to them about Jesus when he had the opportunity he also encouraged others to carry the gospel to them. So we see that even with his background somewhat in Lutheranism, that this pietist movement was a separate uh, movement. And then also with his uh, movement, his group, uh, even though they had similarities to Lutherans, there was another area where he was different. And that is a big difference of uh, he loved the Jewish people and cared for their souls. Uh, because that was very common, that Catholics and Protestants uh, were not friends of the Jewish people. And, uh, and so there was persecution there uh, because of the hatred and for various uh, couple, you know, the couple main reasons whether the you know, Jews were so-called responsible for putting Jesus to death. And then also um, when you have replacement theology and now these churches are the new Israel, so to speak, they've replaced Israel, these groups, uh, that pretty much marginalizes the actual Jewish people and say, well, you're, uh, and, and so they would uh, treat them badly. Uh, the first missionaries were sent out between 1732 and 1737. Uh, they went to St. Thomas in 1732 and preached the gospel to the oppressed slaves there. It was, and and that, was the, that was one of the things about the Moravians is they had such a zeal and a heart for missions that they did the hard things when it came to missions. They did the hard things. Uh, it's been said um, that the, the, there, there's a story told about two Moravian missionaries and they were going on a ship and they were heading off and I don't know if it was the ones that were sent out in this particular case or if it was another time, but two Moravian missionaries who sent out and uh, they knew that pretty much they go, they weren't coming back because they were gonna end up having to be slaves themselves. And, uh, and they said, may the lamb that was slain, at least this is the way the story goes, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering, is what, they, uh, what their heart was, their, what their cry was, is they're on that ship, and the people realizing we'll probably never see these people again, uh, these two individuals uh, again, I think it was two of them. And, but that was their heart, and, that, that was that, and that's a motivation for doing the hard things is may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. In other words, he suffered and he died for these people, and so we want him to receive his reward, and so therefore we're willing to go to the ends of the earth 
even to these places where, there's, where their people are enslaved to preach the gospel to them so that Christ, the lamb that was slain, can have the reward of his suffering. And so what a, uh, what a great heart. And that, and that has to be the heart. I mean, otherwise, it's, it's um, you know, there's the opposite to ex- ex- extremes of, you know, people, uh, Western missionaries will go to Africa or some other place that's, that's a, a, some places that are a bit more uh, in poverty, uh, impoverished, and they'll go and they'll want to live exactly the way they do in the United States. But that's not the way it works, should, not the way it should work. Unless, of course, you go to a city in Africa. A lot, there's a lot of similar living standards in certain cities around the world. But then you get out of the cities and it's not the same. Uh, and so there's the lack of sacrifice there. Of you know, We still want our creature comforts at home and, and it ends up being a bad testimony. So there's the varying mindset and viewpoint uh, on how uh, missions is uh, when, when you go... Uh, particularly overseas. Now, in America, we have a pretty consistent um, living standard unless you get into some very wealthy, affluent areas. And, of course, there are some more depressed areas. But in, by and large, there's a lot, uh, a bit closer uh, standard of living, at least across the general population. And, uh, but in other places, there's extreme differences. And a, someone who's really going to do the work of the Lord has to be willing to make those sacrifices and say, look, I'm leaving the life that I know and that is, e- that is easier uh, as far as the comforts of life, and I'm going to do the hard things. And that's what the Moravians were willing to do. Uh, it was 50 years before missionaries came from any other church or group. In 1733, Matthew Sack and Christian David went to Greenland to preach among the Eskimos, although I don't know if you're supposed to call them Eskimos anymore. Uh, I don't know if you call them Inuit or Natives, First Nations, I don't know, whatever you, <laughs> whatever you want to call them. But Eskimos is apparently not the accepted term because um, it means, uh, I think, eaters of raw flesh. So that is disparaging uh, to the people there. Um, although I guess uh, they probably did eat animals. Oh, I don't know if they ate them raw, you know. They ate raw flesh. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah so, that, they, so but yeah. I don't think it's disparaging to them. It's no, no. Well, that's that, but that's generally. It's not politically correct to call them Eskimos. Okay, that's. I don't think it's necessarily disparaging either if they did eat raw animal flesh. But uh, um, in 1734, some of the Moravians went to Dutch Guinea or Suriname. The first Moravians settled in America in 1734 in Savannah, Georgia. Six years later, they moved to Pennsylvania, where they settled Bethlehem and other towns. Another group founded Salem, North Carolina, in 1766. They had several missions among the Indians in North America. In 1737, George Schmidt went to South Africa. And the Dutch East India Company, he was was there particularly to preach to the the oppressed uh, black people there. The Dutch East India Company treated the blacks very cruelly and called them cattle and really treated them as such. Uh, And the Moravians were often persecuted and resisted by other Protestant groups. Um, They... Schmidt's missionary work in South Africa was opposed by the Dutch Reformed. After six years, they forbade him to preach, forced him to leave, and kept the Moravians out of South Africa for the next 50 years. And and by the way, these were, um, as far as certain doctrines they had, they weren't really that much different. The Moravians were Protestant, here fellow Protestants, but there were apparently, I don't know, uh, the... the, um, the mentality if it was just a threat to their control, um, but, or if there were enough differences, they didn't like what they were doing, but they ended up keeping them out for the next 50 years. They focused many of their efforts on missions, so it was a priority to them. It wasn't just something they did as, as okay, this is just what we do as Christians, this is what we do as, as believers in churches, and, uh, but they, they put a lot of their efforts, it was a great priority uh, for them. They had their 24-hour prayer cycles that we already talked about, and so certainly prayed for missionaries there. Uh, They prayed in services. They wrote and sang hymns about missions. They regularly gathered to hear the reading of letters from missionaries. They discussed missionary matters at their councils. They supported them with sacrificial giving. They sent representatives to visit the missionary works. They created missionary training centers. They purchased and maintained a ship to carry missionaries and supplies to and from Labrador. 
and many of the young Moravians determined to stay, st stay single for the sake of the gospel in order to face the difficulties of mission work. They had special groups for the single brethren and single sisters, which became extended families. Each group had their own devotions and prayers. And so here they were even so dedicated to the missionary work that some of the younger ones were willing to say, I I'm, because I'm called to this and I, I'm, my heart is in this, I'm not even going to seek to get married uh, because of my great devotion to uh, the work of, of missions. The Moravian missionaries established communities for their converts. They established schools. They instructed, the, they, so they taught them to read. They instructed the girls in sewing. They trained the young men in various trades. They taught them to be industrious, orderly, loyal, and to seek Christ continually. They also practiced strict church discipline. Uh, and finally, the Moravians challenged many others in missions. Um, William Carey got part of his inspiration about missions from the Moravians. The particular Baptist churches that he was associated with were so, in, in Great Britain, were so Calvinistic that they, they, they cared nothing about missions. They, were not, they did not have a heart in missions. They were not involved in that. And so William Carey was then in, uh, influenced by them. He saw what they were doing and said, this, this uh, looks right. Uh, this looks like a good thing. And we'll talk about William Carey next week. Uh, Carey's co-laborer Joshua Marshman, uh, the London Missionary Society, and Robert Moffat were also influenced by the Moravians, by, some, by the, some of their own testimonies. Joshua Marshman, his own testimony was about the Moravians and how they set the example and were an encouragement to, uh, to him uh, regarding missions. And so that's, that's really the thing to remember and the thing to be challenged on, challenge us on. Doesn't, uh, the Moravians, they have their own communities, and I'm not... Um, promoting communal living in that way, in that sense. But at the same time, they were able to get a lot done for the sake of the gospel, for the, in the work of the Lord. They were to get a lot done. And, uh, and they're a great example as far as they're not just doing it, but what their zeal was. Their heart for missions uh, was of a great uh, encouragement. Any questions? Um, Joanna? Bethlehem, there's a, there's a city in Pennsylvania called Bethlehem. Does it mean that the Bethlehem that Jesus was born? No, no, it was a different one. It's in Pennsylvania. So they probably named it after the town where Jesus was born. Uh, but it was, so the Moravians settled that area, and so they probably decided to call it Bethlehem because of Bethlehem in the Bible. Yeah. Denise? Yeah. I don't know if this was the same time period or what, but I had read about a couple of missionaries that were going off in a boat, and those on the shore were saying, you might die, are you sure you want to do this? Mm -hmm. And they replied, we've already died. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could have been the same ones, I'm not sure. There might be different versions of the story, who knows, you know. Um, but absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and that was their heart. That was their heart for missions. Uh, that was their their commitment to it, um, and they wanted to see people saved. They wanted to get the message to them, and so a great uh, commitment to that, which is a great example. Well, something we can use today, Christians could use that today, many churches could use that uh, today, because there's this attitude of we want to, we, yeah, we want to do the work of the Lord, but we really want to do it in a way that's very comfortable for us. And so the priority is still our comfort, the priority is still what we want, and it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, okay, what comes first? Putting God first and being totally committed to what he has called us to do. And yes, there are times where the nature, depending on the nature of where God sends somebody, it's going to be harder than other places. But the, the real issue is the heart issue of are we willing? Are you willing to do whatever God wants you to do? Do the hard things, do the things that are uncomfortable and uh, follow his leading. Uh, so we're going to finish. We have just a little bit more with the Moravians next week, and then, and then we'll talk about uh, the first Baptist missionaries from Great Britain, uh, William Carey, and then also from America, Adoniram Judson. And so that's actually how we'll finish out that book, and then we'll shift into um, s some other uh, follow-up <laughs> material to uh, get us up to more of the present day.